Behind the beauty and excitement of horse racing, there is drudgery. For every hopeful boy who graduates to the rainbow silks of the jockey, there are scores who stay in the shabby sweater of the stable lad. Boys who sign on with racing stables are drawn by the romantic success of such as Lester Pigott, England's champion jockey, by the dream of sitting on the favourite in a great race. They're under starter's orders. They're off in the 2,000 guineas, and the first to show is Soblers. Soblers from Ray Marley, Pachingo towards the near side, then comes Lucky Finish and Connaught, and then on the far side of Connaught is Lawrence Accio, and Soblest in the sheepskin noseband is making it from Ray Marley in second, Connaught is third, Pachingo four, spot the blue colours with the white hoop, and then comes Lucky Finish. On the left of Lucky Finish there on the inside is Dal Ryan, then Jimmy Redman and Soblest taking him along, Soblest in the sheepskin noseband from Dal Ryan over on the far side, the light colours in the red cap, and then comes the black colours in the red cap of Connaught, and then Pachingo towards the near side, and Soblest really taking him along now, he's striding along like a real sprint. So blessed from Patingo, Chep's lad showing there on the right, the yellow colours with the black hoops, then Connaught on the inside behind Connaught, his lucky finish, and then comes Jimmy Rapid, and Survivor really got it to do now, and as they hit the rising ground, so with an electrifying burst, Survivor coming there, Survivor on the far side, so blessed, the sheepskin nose the white face of Patingo showing there, and now it's a duel, as so blessed weakens between Survivor and Patingo, and as Survivor hits the rising ground, he's lengthening his stride like a great horse, he's pounding up the hill now, and Survivor going away from Patingo in second, Jimmy Rapid third, and that's the order of the race to the line, Survivor. In the first of the five English classics of 1968, Pickett has emphasized that he's not only a great rider of horses, but a great judge of them. After the choice of Patingo or Sir Ivor, he has chosen wisely and ridden brilliantly. It is the beginning of one of the most remarkable partnerships in the history of the turf. Right head, neck off. Figure trained by Mr. M.B. O'Brien in Ireland. Thank you. Trained M.B. O'Brien in Ireland. Just about the most impressive credentials a horse can have. <laughs> As a trainer of racehorses, Vincent O'Brien has the kind of stature that invites cliché. To most of the racing press, he is the Tipperary wizard. To respectful owners like Lord Harrington, he is a mild, infinitely knowledgeable craftsman. They would rather ask him for advice than try to give him orders. No other trainer anywhere has achieved such comprehensive success. The Grand National, the most intimidating steeplechase in the world, almost became an O'Brien benefit when he won it three times in a row in the 50s, and every English classic on the flat has fallen to his string at least once. Yet he remains the least blasé of his kind. Each horse is treated as a second survivor until proved a second rater. It is on these gallops with their testing, strengthening gradients that Sir Ivor himself must now be prepared for the challenges that will determine whether he is just a phenomenal miler or the rarest of all thoroughbreds. A true champion capable of decisive acceleration at the end of an exhausting mile and a half in the very best company. The best company is what he can expect from Newmarket. This is the absolute heart of English racing. An entire town dedicated to the reality and mythology of the sport. Here, it is said, 
The sausages sold in the shops are made from derby winners. If it were true, the local butchers would be casting covetous eyes on this string, for these animals are in the charge of Noel Merlis, a northerner who has made himself the greatest English trainer of his time. Merlis's record in the classics is as formidable as O'Brien's, and now in the early summer of 1968, he faces the 1,000 guineas, reassured by the memory of winning the race the previous season, along with the 2,000 guineas and the derby. The stable's hopes are with Kigurley, a filly bred, owned and trained by the Merlis family and ridden by the Scottish prodigy, Sandy Barclay. And bouncing from the stalls, it's Sovereign who goes into an immediate lead. Sovereign Ron Hutchinson in the sheepskin noseband. And being joined now by Lester Pickett on Lally Beeler from the Survivor stable. And it's Sovereign from Lally Beeler on the near side, nearest to us, that is, the yellow cap Lester. Then comes Sandy Barkley, insert on Kigurley, then photo flash and Lamar, and behind Lamar is Corsell. And it's still Lally Beeler on the near side from Sovereign on the far side. These two almost inseparable. Kigurley is third, and just in behind Kigurley is photo flash, and then comes traveling fair. Corsell's making a little bit of progress towards the outside and then comes on Audrey and now as they begin to hit the rising ground Lally Beeler weakens dramatically and Kigurley comes to take her place and it's Kigurley young Sandy Barkley center there the blue colors and the yellow cross belts over on the far side still the sheepskin nose band Ron Hutchinson on sovereign photo flash towards the near side and now Kigurley going away from them 20 year old Sandy Barkley on this all Merlis really beginning to hit the rising ground now looking over his shoulders left and right for danger Sandy he doesn't see any as Kigurley keeps up a relentless gallop he's racing up the hill towards the line now with photo flash moving into second and sovereign third racing to the line now and Sandy's got it sewn up on Kigurley and Kigurley coming to the line the winner of the 1000 guineas from Photo Flash second and Sovereign third and that's the result Kigurley first Photo Flash and Sovereign So Merlis who had the first claim on Pickett until the champion broke with him abruptly has found another outstanding jockey and in Newmarket, which has a spinsterish enthusiasm for gossip, they say the enigmatic three-year-old Connaught will be a worthy partner in the derby. As always, Merlis turns his back on questions. Elsewhere in Newmarket, Churchill looks down as racing's more formal business is transacted in lounge suits. Lester Pickett's is an unfamiliar face in the councils of the jockey club. The ruling body of the sport, with a class-conscious history that goes back three centuries, is thick with titles and tradition, but at last hopeful attempts are being made to modernize its outlook. Here, policy and punishments are determined. The massive sums of money invested by men like Raymond Guest, the owner of Sir Ivor, add to the responsibilities of the jockey club. Racing is now an international bloodstock industry. At Ballygoran, on about 200 acres of rich Irish grassland, Guest, who, in 1968, was the United States Ambassador to Ireland, has set up a magnificently appointed stud where a dozen valuable mares are prepared for luxurious motherhood. Guest does not mean to rely on the luck he had when he bought Sir Ivor for the bargain price of $42,000 at the Keenan sales in America. 760, at the new market sales, Captain Marcus Limas is renewing the search for the classic winner he believed he had found until Patingo was outclassed by Sir Ivor. 1,200. It was in this sale ring that vaguely noble, who will have a vital influence on Sir Ivor's year, was bought for France at a European record price of 136,000 guineas. At one six-day session of the new market sales, three and a half million pounds were spent on bloodstock, almost half of it going for export. 18, 1850, It is a place for the top people of racing to congregate and play the expensive game of trying to find the animals which, directly or through their descendants, or dominate the seasons to come. Against you this side. Will you have another hundred at 2,006? Done then last time then at 2,600. Mr. Barling, 2,600. While Raymond Guest's investment at Barry Gordon matures slowly, a more impetuous gamble is due for sudden settlement. Long before Sir Ivor had shown his worth, Guest backed him at 100 to 1 for the Epsom Derby, and he stands to win more than 60,000 pounds.
Epsom, where all the theories, the experiments, the scientific equations and idealistic dreams that go with the breeding of classic horses are put to the ultimate test. Day is the most evocative and democratic occasion in the British racing calendar. A day when thousands who normally restrict their race going to the corner betting shop turn out on the downs. Many of them will be looking the other way when the field comes round Tattenham Corner, beating jelly deals or putting a child on a roundabout, but later they will tell vehemently how the race was won and lost. And they'll be entitled to their say, for they will have been an essential part of it all. It is a day when you don't have to be wearing top hat and morning suit in the members' enclosure to join in the high living. You can drink champagne just as well on the top of the bus. Even on Derby Day, some people have to stay in character. Yet the irksome trappings of a royal visit cannot prevent Queen Elizabeth from enjoying the day out. For her, going to the races is no public duty, but a private pleasure. In the jockey's dressing room, it is too late for any but the most minor adjustments. Everything possible has been done to get these men and the horses they will ride ready for this moment. Now they're on their own. And none carries a heavier responsibility than Pickett and his young successor as Merlis's jockey, Sandy Barclay. and the Duke of Norfolk have come into the paddock as owners often enough. But on this occasion they can afford to be relaxed spectators and leave the worrying to such as Vincent O'Brien. But looking at the deep bloom of Sir Ivor's coat, the firm rhythm of his walk, O'Brien does not have to worry too much. Merlis too can be encouraged by the appearance of Connaught. The Big Bay was inclined to fight the starting stalls and lose earlier in his career, but there is confidence that he will go in quietly today and come out running. isn't a jockey to whom trainers issue detailed instructions, certainly not before the derby. At the age of 32, he's about to seek his fourth victory in the race. Raymond Guest, absent on ambassador's duties, knows that his 100 to 1 wager will not be in better hands.
A man as experienced and intelligent as O'Brien is content to give Pickett a leg up and let him get on with it. Barclay is a dozen years younger, but he is no novice. Of course, he's not at all certain to be a two-man, two-horse confrontation. Ron Hutchison on Mount Athos intends to be there when the prizes are given out. Had Romand's preparation not been undermined by illness, Joe Mercer would have fancied himself to beat the lot of them. Supporters of Sir Ivor have been suggesting they will take a bomb to stop him from winning, and for a moment it seems that someone has taken them seriously. But the law steps in firmly, and the incident passes unnoticed by the tense figures behind the starting stalls. The derby, with prize money now averaging around £70,000, is far from being the richest race for three-year-olds. And many would say the course is far from being the fairest. It rises unevenly by 150 feet in the first six furlongs. Then swings steeply down and round Tatnall Corner into the straight. The next climb comes suddenly 50 yards from the winning post, just to the point where it does most damage to a tiring horse. <laughs> yards from the finish, young Sandy Barkley had felt sure of winning his first derby. Suddenly, Bigot finds he is commiserating not with a hardened rival, but a shattered boy. For once the French neglected the derby, but at Chantilly there is growing confidence that the Phillies' equivalent, the Epsom Oaks, is at their mercy.
In a season which has seen a substantial amount of their prize money exported to England, the French are in a mood to take reprisals, and the flawless early form of La Lagune has convinced her trainer, Francois Boutin, that she will win the Oaks. Boutin has the looks of a boulevardier, but he is a professional. They say she's unprepossessing from the front, but most of her rivals see her from behind. Gerard de Boeuf is solidly built for a jockey, but our lagoon has the hindquarters to carry weight. Side from Golden Moss, then comes our Ruby. La Laguna is a long way behind at the moment as they begin the turn into Tattenham Corner. It's Denosa on the inside from Golden Moss towards the outer, swinging into the turn now, and Denosa and Golden Moss disputing it. And look left and spot the broad white face there of La Lagoon moving with long, flowing, effortless strides. She's coming to mow them down now towards the stand side. It's La Lagoon coming to pick up this Oaks field with contemptuous ease. It's La Lagoon still pulling Gerard Tiber out of the saddle as she comes to pick up Cloud One and Pandora Bay. La Lagoon striding away from them now, and it's La Lagoon, long way clear, turning a race into a procession. And it's La Lagoon, the winner. Cloud One is second and Pandora Bay third. Tiber doesn't just smile, he laughs. It was that sort of performance. I've never seen a race like this. It has been a slaughter so spectacular that La Lagoon's admirers have the right to wonder if she can rise above the normal limitations of fillies. Can she, in fact, trouble the Colts and the Prix de la Patrion, the most valuable race in Europe? But long before that question is answered, Sir Ivor is to have a well-paid lap of honour on his home ground. This time, however, there will be no partnership with Pickett, who will be on Ribeiro, a colt that has so far been no great credit to his sire, the peerless Italian champion, Rebo. Sir Ivor, who looks as lively as ever, is written by Liam Ward, 
first jockey to Vincent O'Brien on Irish courses. Coming up with the two furlong marker now in the Irish sweeps derby, and as they do so, Lester Pickett on Ribeiro and Liam Ward on Survivor make a simultaneous break for it, and it's Ribeiro in the lead from Survivor. Ribeiro from Survivor. Liam Ward looks over his left shoulder to see if he's in danger from behind. He doesn't see any, but can he catch Ribeiro? Ribeiro lengthening his stride now as he enters the 550 yards. It's Ribeiro from Survivor, and Ribeiro going away from Survivor now as they race up towards the line. It's Ribeiro from Survivor. Valdeos moved into third and coming up towards the line. Ribeiro's holding Survivor at the line. Ribeiro's the winner. Survivor's second, and Valdeos is third. Even the discrepancy in the betting odds, 3 to 1 on Sir Ivor and 106 against Ribeiro, doesn't convey the full stunning extent of the upset. Pickett on Ribeiro has again demonstrated his brilliance and his years assuming a pattern of incredible success. But Sir Ivor was clearly far short of his best, and no sensible critic blames Liam Ward for the defeat. Raymond Guest, the most adventurous of owners, is undismayed. Within a week, Pickett and Sir Ivor are reunited and sent into the arena again. The Eclipse Stakes at Sandown offer Sandy Barkley a chance to avenge his Derby defeat. Barkley rides Royal Palace, the 1967 2000 Guineas and Derby winner, who has developed into a magnificent unbeaten four-year-old. France has a big threat in the Eclipse Stakes because Taj Dwan is a specialist at a mile and a quarter and has run Royal Palace desperately close in the past. Coming to the final furlough marker now, and as they do so, it's Taj Dewan for France with Maïf Saint-Martin from Royal Palace for England, written by Sandy Barkley, then comes Lester Pickett for Ireland on Saraiva. Coming to the final 150 yards now, and it's Taj Dewan from Royal Palace, Taj Dewan and Royal Palace, then comes Saraiva, Taj Dewan on the far side, Royal Palace on the near side as they come up towards the line. It's a very close thing between Royal Palace and Taj Dewan at the line, it's just Royal Palace. Third place in that eclipse was no disgrace. But Saraiva carries back to Ireland serious doubts about his status as a truly great horse. O'Brien decides to rest Sir Ivor, giving up hope of making him the third horse this century to take the triple crown of Guineas, Derby and St. Ledger. So, Pickett rejoins Ribeiro for the next stage of an unforgettable season in the raw Yorkshire setting of Doncaster home of the oldest and longest of the five classics. It is one of those English days when it is an advantage for race girls to be good swimmers. But Pickett is unworried about the heavy going. The big question appears to be not whether Ribeiro will stay the one mile six and a half furlongs, but whether he will stay better than Connaught or the Irish challenger Canterbury. The Derby third, Mount Athos, is an extra complication. From the moment they leave the stalls, it is clear that Pickett is in no hurry to assert Ribeiro's class.
often happens, he is content to drop in at the rear of the field, where the clods are lying. He tends to ride a private race, using his own wonderful sense of pace to protect him against the rashness of other jockeys. He may wait in front or behind, but always he will wait until the feel of the horse tells him it is time to go. Some tired horses now as they enter the closing stages of this mud slog with Connaught palpably sinking into this town more turf and Mount Athos already pulled up and as they come into the final furlong and a half now it's alignment being pressed by Ribeiro and Lester Pickett on Ribeiro as they just come up to the furlong marker taking the lead and it's Ribeiro in the lead now being pressed by Canterbury towards the near side Ribeiro on the far side of Canterbury Canterbury nearest to us now and it's Bill Williamson on Canterbury coming up to challenge Lester Pickett on Ribeiro Lester nursing Ribeiro home now as he enters the final 150 yards Canterbury on the near side Ribeiro on the far side as they come up towards the line it's just Ribeiro Right Bureau, right Bureau, the winner from Canterbury second, and Cold Storage third. <laughs> Triumphant returns are a matter of necessity as well as habit to Lester Pickett. Since he began race riding at the age of 12, he has been sustained by winning, never mellowed by it. His riding may be less ruthlessly aggressive than in his early years, but is no less competitive or courageous. Even to many people inside racing, he remains a remote, aloof, almost mysterious figure. The one thing that is plain and unambiguous about him is his talent. It is, quite simply, one of the greatest ever to distinguish the sport. Pickett's talent, allied to Sir Ivor's, gives Vincent O'Brien hopes of winning the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe for the second time. Memories of the Epsom Derby nourish the ambition. Bhutan has had to nurse Dal Lagoon through an illness since the Oaks, but it is that pulverizing victory he remembers. The Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe at Longchamp in the Bois de Boulogne is now established as one of the greatest of all races, and the entries of the 1968 event guarantee one of the most significant contests in its history. Above all, it will bring about a decisive confrontation between Sir Ivor and vaguely noble, the coat England lost to France in the sale ring. The Arc de Triomphe is a rather special animal act, and the human stars are happy to take second billing. No sport draws the rich, the celebrated, and the glamorous as consistently as horse racing. And the crowds, like the fields, become more cosmopolitan every season. Uh, 
10 is vaguely noble. This is the first time he has influenced the year of Sir Ivor, who wears number 12. La Lagoon is here too. But already the public, through the betting, have shown that they regard the race as being between the Australian Bill Williamson on Bagley Noble and Lester Pickett on Sir Ivor. that represents an entirely true test of middle distance horses. In a field of this caliber, even animals with an exceptional acceleration must be kept well in touch and Williamson soon has vaguely noble on the heels of the leaders. running to the home turn with Argent still there, so is Petro, Roselier towards the outside and poised in the center is Bagley Noble. And as they level up into the straight now, exploding like a bolt in the gold colors there, is Bagley Noble exploding right out of the pack and going right away from him now, streaking away into the home stretch with Roselier following. It's driver putting in a sprint just in behind him, but nothing will peg back Bagley Noble. He's striding on, he's keeping up a relentless, powerful gallop as he races up towards the line. Shriver striving to get at him, but he can't cut down that lead at all. It's Bagley Noble, clear of Survivor in second. Carmarthen finishing well in third, but at the line, Bagley Noble from Survivor and Carmarthen. And what a real championship performance this by Bagley Noble. And no wonder that Etienne Follet, who's trained him so brilliantly with this one race in mind, puts him in the Seabird class. Etienne Follet's strategy of aiming Bagley Noble specifically at the Arc de Triomphe has been rewarded. And Sir Ivor, in the autumn of an exhausting season, simply could not hold him. But now Vaguely Noble walks through his exultant backers towards a stud career in which he'll be syndicated for a total of more than two million pounds. He is walking out of Sir Ivor's life, and Sir Ivor cannot decide to see him go. The Irish, predictably, are not at all willing to let the racing world remember their champion as a splendidly honorable loser. Vincent O'Brien feels that Sir Ivor might have done even better in the Arctic Triumph with a trouble-free preparation. And now, determined that the Derby winner will make a glorious exit, O'Brien heads him towards another great event, the Washington International at Laurel, Maryland. A 
American-born and widely travelled as he is, Sir Ivor is liable to be more than a shade disconcerted by the sudden switch from the rustic peace of Tipperary to the razzmatazz of Laurel, where invited runners from all over Europe and the Americas compete in an atmosphere that is by Barnum out of Madison Avenue. But he will be reassured by a supply of Irish water. And, of course, there will be the calming presence of Lester Pickett, who gives the impression that he could play solitaire in a whirlwind. Laurel is a ferociously sharp left-hand course where the crowd see the field make a circuit and a half of the grass track to complete the 12 furlongs. They're off at 3.30 Eastern Standard Time and Carmarthen is slow from the stalls and the first to take it up is Takshi Baro for Japan from Zara Alexander and Fort Marcy. Then comes Patron and Azincourt. Carmarthen making up his ground in seventh is Sir Ivor and eighth and trailing is La Lagoon. They're racing around the first turn now and as they do so it's Takshi Baro from Zara Alexander. Then comes Fort Marcy behind Fort Marcy is Patron and then comes Carmarthen who's made up his ground and into the straight for the first time. Takshi Baro for Zara from Zara Alexander. Patron on the far side then Carmarthen and Fort Marcy. Then comes Sir Ivor on the inside of Azincourt and then La Lagoon and Lester Bigot playing it very cool at the moment on Sir Ivor. He's well off the pace as the leaders go into the next turn. Takshi Barrow still leading from Zara Alexander, Fort Marcy, Petron and Carmarthen, stride for stride. Then comes Sir Ivor. Sir Ivor still well off the pace. Is Lester Bigot worried at this stage? Well, if he isn't, he's the only Sir Ivor supporter who isn't because of their racing now to the final turn. And as they do so, Takshi Barrow's losing ground. And Zara Alexander and Fort Marcy really piling it on. Lester Bigot on the inside on Sir Ivor, boxed in like a sardine as it looks all America around the home turn with Zara Alexander and Fort Marcy Carmarthen on the outside and now Lester Bigot winkling Sir Ivor out for a challenge and as he does so Sir Ivor produces a devastating thrust he's getting to him now he's heating him up like a great champion he's pulverizing him and up the line Sir Ivor's made it Bigot and Sir Ivor are the first challengers from England or Ireland to succeed at Laurel since Wu Win won the inaugural running in 1952. And they have done so at a time when the international is established as a race of major importance. The reaction of the American press, unaccustomed to Pickett's devastating use of the late run from behind, is less than ecstatic. They should talk to those men who try to earn a living riding against him week after week. For most people, the unique excitement of horse racing can be measured in a chain of vivid memories those fleeting moments of blur and thunder that decide the great races. In 1968, most of those moments belonged to Sir Ivor and to the very special man who was on his back. <laughs> 